Hi, and thanks for coming to my talk. Blah, blah, metaverse, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <coughs> In keeping with the overall vibe of DICE, I'm not going to give you a hard pitch for anything or try to pound home some ex-cathedra pronouncements about the metaverse. I want to sketch out some thoughts I've been having in the last few weeks and that are still taking shape. A couple of weeks ago, I was doing some unrelated research, and I stumbled across this 90-year-old cartoon by animation legend Ub Iwerks. The setting will be familiar to people who've played games set in a generic European medieval swords and sorcery milieu. But for the most part, it doesn't take place in a fancy castle, and it doesn't involve knights. Instead, the main setting is this rundown farmstead. Living there are Jack and his mom. They begin with a very small inventory of basic possessions. They have three plates, one of which is chipped, a bone with no meat on it, a candle that's mostly burned down, some furniture, some livestock. There's an opening cut scene in which they talk about a serious cash flow crunch impacting their livelihood and decide to sell the cow. Jack takes the cow to market. <clears throat> From the expression on the cow's face, I think we can assume that she doesn't have a very good understanding of what actually happens inside the butcher shops. <laughs> the butcher evaluates the merchandise by literally using her protruding ribs as a xylophone, then reaches into his pocket and pulls out a handful of fiat currency, coin of the realm. Again, the cow isn't fully understanding the implications. Jack's keen on grabbing those coins, but then, out of nowhere, he gets poked on the shoulder by a crypto bro. <laughs> the cow's reaction says it all. He's wearing dark glasses as some kind of anonymization strategy, but given his blue skin and orange top hat, I don't think it's going to work. Anyway, he tells Jack, dude, don't accept that currency. You're just buying into a centralized system controlled by oppressive governments. I'll pay for your cow in magic beans. <laughs> they can do everything fiat currency can do, but they have magical powers that go way beyond that. They can sprout legs and sing and dance and execute smart contracts on the chain. <laughs> So Jack totally falls for it and brings the magic beans home. Mom loses it, throws them out the window, and chases him out of the house throwing pots and pans at him. So the moral of the story is don't accept magic beans from blue weirdos in front of the butcher shop. <laughs> oh wait, that's not actually the end, and it's not the moral. It would have made for a nice pat ending, but that's not where this is going. The next morning, Jack wakes up to discover that the blue dude wasn't lying. They actually were magic beings. They actually did have incredible powers. And in the course of investigating this amazing result, he literally ascends to a higher plane of existence, <laughs> populated by giants whose net worth is as huge as their physical stature, huge sacks of gold lying around. There's a chicken that lays golden eggs, and a humanoid harp that's kind of like Siri. You can, you can ask it to play any kind of music as long as it's harp music. But before long, Jack realizes he's in over his head. The people who live on this plane of existence are enormously powerful and rich, and they're not nice. They see him primarily as food. So he bails. He's like, I don't want to be a hodler anymore. He returns to his hovel, and he air gaps his connection to this higher plane. <laughs> deletes his browser history, unsubscribes from everything. But this has the unexpected side effect of triggering a crash <clears throat> that converts the incredibly rich giant into a smoking crater. So the moral of the story is probably don't get involved with such people in the first place. Be content with your humble lifestyle on the farm. It's a little bit in that way like the Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. Except that's not actually the end. <laughs> this is the end. Somehow Jack and his mom find their way back up to the giant's castle and move in. They've got 24-7 harp music, servants shoveling caviar into their mouths, and they've got the magic chicken sitting on this perch. 
so that every time it lays a golden egg, it rolls down this chute and drops into the open drawer of a cash register. Some kind of metaphor for Bitcoin mining, I guess. <clears throat> that actually is the end. So the whole story is kind of all over the map, and there's no clear-cut moral that you can draw from it. But one theme that's pretty unmistakable is volatility. Jack and his mom have a very low volatility, albeit poor life until the moment he accepts the magic beans, and after that, the volatility is off the charts. He's exposed to unimaginable wealth and terrible people. He tries to go back to his poverty-stricken farmstead. The rich giant ends up at the bottom of a literal crater. Jack and his mom become billionaires. The parallels to the crypto world are obvious. I want to explore these themes a little by talking for a bit about <clears throat> transactions and financialization. Let's break down in detail <clears throat> what's going on when they decide to sell the cow. First of all, <clears throat> they can get along without it. That's not true of the house. They need that for shelter. Secondly, there is actually a market mechanism for selling the cow in the form of the butcher shop. That's not true of other items in the house, such as the bone. Third, selling the cow will bring in enough cash to make a difference in their life. It's not true of their goldfish, for example, which is a skeleton with an animated head. <laughs> Jack's mother has agency in the matter. She is the sole owner of the cow. She is the only adult in the household. She throws pots and pans to enforce her will. <clears throat> Finally, the cow appears to have zero sentimental value. No intangible value, in other words, to balance against its monetary value, which is funny because the cow is the most relatable character in the whole piece. <laughs> and I sort of hope that the blue guy turns out to be a vegetarian. Now let's apply the same analysis to a piece of UGC in a game. Any game would work. As it happens, I play Valheim with a couple of friends who shall go unnamed, but they know their way around the game industry. As such, this is simply the game I'm currently most familiar with, and I'm going to use it as the basis for my next case study, but you could apply the same reasoning to many other games. This is our current base. It's nothing to write home about. We have built much, much fancier bases, but this one serves our needs at the moment. What would have to be true for us to sell this piece of user-generated content? Let's apply the same criteria as for the cow. Of course we can get along without it. It's just a pretend thing in a game. There is no market because Valheim doesn't have that feature, but some games do have markets, so I'm going to keep going as if this were no obstacle. Unless I'm very much mistaken, there's no way that selling this thing could ever bring in enough money to change our lives. Ownership and agency. Well, I guess we co-own it. Here's our little group, and as you can see, we can't even face in the same direction <laughs> long enough to take a selfie. Our play style is pretty similar. We spend 75% of the game retrieving each other's corpses. <laughs> Could we all agree on whether to sell our base and how much to sell it for? Doubtful. So we don't have real agency, and perhaps more importantly, our base fails the no intangible value test. We like our base a lot more than Jack's mom likes her cow. Humble as it is, we've put a lot of work into it. We know where everything is. We've defended it from raids and rebuilt it after it took damage. There are trophies on the walls and memories connected with those trophies. Every time we come back to it after an adventure, we get a warm feeling of being back in the safety and comfort of our own home. So it's very unlikely that we would sell our base even if we had the option to do so. Exchanging it for money would just feel wrong. The third case study basically consists of taking the Valheim case and transferring it into the real world. <clears throat> would I ever consider selling the stuff in my house? This is not my house <clears throat> because I forgot to take a picture before I left home. But it's kind of like my house if I had better taste. If you came to my house, you'd see a lot of books. You'd see furniture, because it's easier to read books when you're sitting down, and light fixtures, because it's also helpful to be able to see. Other people might have different stuff in their houses, 
this same analysis still applies, mutatis mutandis, whether you're a collector of fine art, vintage action figures, or whatever. Can I get along without this stuff? Yes, most of what's in my house isn't needed for physical survival. Is there a market? Yes, there's a market for used books, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. And I could always drag my furniture out into the yard and put up a sign that says garage sale and get at least a few bucks for it. Is the price high enough to make a difference in my life? Probably not, unless things get really bad. Do I have ownership and agency? Yes. The intangible value test. This is the real obstacle preventing me from selling my stuff. So this table summarizes the three case studies of the cow, the Valheim base, and my stuff. I would draw your attention to these two red squares and these two, because the crux of the argument I'm trying to make is situations where people generally aren't interested in selling goods, be they virtual or real, even if they could do so, because their intangible value is high compared to the price that they can fetch. I think that books are a good way to explore this, so I'm going to riff on that for a minute. I own a lot of books. There is absolutely a market for used books. The total book market is about $142 billion, and the used book market is 17% of that, or about $24 billion. I know people who work in that business, and by and large, they are book lovers. They are readers and writers, at least the ones I hang out with. But when I was looking into this, I found that there are these extreme corners of the used book market where it has become commoditized to a degree that kind of strips books of their dignity. There are companies that will sell you books by the yard just to decorate a room, and they'll select them by the colors of their jackets so that you can make sure they don't clash with your color scheme. You can also buy them wrapped up in paper, any color of paper you like. There's even a trend of displaying them with the spine turned away. There's something about the use of books in this way that instinctively sets your teeth on edge if you care about books. And the thesis I'm trying to develop here is that this is related to how game devs often feel when outsiders push the idea of the financialization of game objects. <laughs> Here's a real bookcase from the inventory of someone who actually reads books. You can tell at a glance that this is legit. Books are toppling over as people pull them out and put them back. It's a live bookcase. The books are not wrapped in paper. They are not arranged by color. In fact, there is no arrangement. Hardcover, paperback, fiction, nonfiction, doesn't matter. We have books by Kafka and Geoffrey Chaucer sharing a shelf with a Ken Follett spy thriller. The Amber Spyglass is up there. <clears throat> Some of the books are fancy hardcover editions. Others look like this cheap mass market copy of Dan Simmons' The Fall of Hyperion, which has been used up to the point where it would have virtually no value on the used book market, but its intangible value to the owner is significant, and they'd be sad if they lost it. In a way, the same thing that makes it financially worthless is what gives it emotional value. A lot of you have probably seen this famous quote from Donald Knuth, premature optimization is the root of all evil. As I think about Web3 and games, I increasingly believe that premature financialization is the root of all evil. A few days ago, I was chatting about this with Rebecca Barkin, who is the CEO of Lamina One, a metaverse infrastructure startup I co-founded last year. And she said, you can't architect a compelling experience backward from a desired financial outcome, which I liked enough that I wrote it down. The general point I'm getting at here is that I do think that markets for goods can coexist with dignity and respect for the intangible value of those goods, and that it's a really constructive thing when they do. The existence of a used book market, for example, doesn't strip everyone's used books of their uniqueness. Even when some vendors are selling books by the yard, there are other people working in that business who do care about what's between the covers of those books. And that's part of what makes the books and the market valuable. If everyone switched to a books by the yard mentality, that market would crash. 
it would immediately be reduced to whatever the aggregate value of books is when they are measured by the yard, and people would just start mass producing blank books with nothing in them. How do we apply these lessons to games and potentially to the metaverse, which I think is going to grow out of the game industry? There's been a lot of heated debate in the last couple of years about Web3 and blockchain and games, with the expression on the cow's face here representing the mildest and most polite possible reaction. <laughs> At the same time, there's a gnawing awareness that somewhere up there in crypto land, there might be a lot of this. But especially after 2022, everyone also knows that there's a lot of this. So is there a way that we can get to this? Well, I'm a believer in the quote from Rebecca Barkin that I mentioned a couple of slides back, namely that if you start with this and try to architect backward into a game or more broadly a metaverse experience, you're going to fail. And the cause of that failure is somewhat intangible, and I haven't figured out a way to articulate it yet, but it has something to do with the difference between these two bookshelves and why one of them immediately sets off alarm bells while the other is obviously real. So the, um, it's a sales pitch for a company that will actually sell you things like it. It's financialization without respect for what's being financialized. I would argue that the game industry is fundamentally in the business of selling the intangibles that confer value far above and beyond what can be immediately registered in markets. Going back to this table, I would argue that the cow column, the red rectangle, is basically the signature of a bad market. There's a bunch of stuff floating around that people don't really need, that has no intangible value, and that's worth a lot of magic beans. That's going to lead to churn, which leads to volatility. Because in any real market, it's not just the currency that sets the value of the goods. It's the goods in the aggregate that set the value of the currency. If the goods have no intangible value, then they're just skins wrapped around money. And the game containing those virtual goods is just a skin wrapped around a market in financial derivatives a market that has no ballast and no stability. So why do I think that this can work? Basically because of Warcraft and games like it, EVE Online being another example. Warcraft Gold, like it or not, has been a hard currency forever. It's famously more stable than some national fiat currencies. I wrote a whole novel on this topic, ReamD, more than 10 years ago. People in the game industry, even the ones who are extremely skeptical of Web3 and blockchain, don't seem terribly worried about this. Sure, there's a marketplace for virtual goods, including gold, that coexists with the game itself. But it hasn't ruined the game any more than the existence of a used book market has ruined books. There are some people, gold miners and so on, who interact with Warcraft primarily as a financial play. Just the same way that the book world has people who sell books by the yard. But most people play Warcraft for the joy of it and for the experiences they have with their friends and enemies. They're not particularly eager to liquidate their inventories of virtual goods because the magic swords or whatever in those inventories have utility as well as intangible qualities, the memories associated with them, pride in achievement, aesthetic value, story. That's how you get to the experiences in the green box in which intangible value begins to outweigh mere market price and people are less inclined to just run out and sell everything. So to sum up, I believe that Warcraft, EVE Online, and similar games are existence proofs for in-game hard currency economies that don't wreck the game. But the only reason they are stable is because the games are fun and the people who play those games trust the makers to continue delivering the intangible characteristics that make them fun. This makes the currencies actually stable and produces a virtuous circle that has the potential to make in-game and in-metaverse economies as stable as real-world markets for things like books. The fundamental paradox that we all have to wrap our heads around is that the harder you try to build such a system to deliver financial rewards, as Rebecca pointed out, the more certain you are to fail. There used to be a debate as to whether video games were art. 
the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences was, I think, created at least in part to put that debate to rest. If there are still any doubters, I think that the argument I've tried to put forth in this talk is as close as you can come to a mathematical proof that games are art, and moreover, that art has value not only for its own sake, but measurable economic value as well. Thanks for coming to my talk. Congratulations to the finalists, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference.